Hello and welcome. My name is Heather. This is Miss Finn. And this is Nice People, where we talk about the kinds of things nice people don't talk about. I've got a question for you. If someone was accused of CSA, would you believe them if, in their defense, they made up a syndrome, claimed their victim had it, and said that that was proof that their victim's memories of the abuse couldn't possibly be real? Would you buy that? Now what if I told you that people like Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, and Ghislaine Maxwell all tried, unsuccessfully, to use the same made-up syndrome in their defense? Oh yeah, this really happened. And in the next few videos, I'm exposing everything there is to know about False Memory Syndrome and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I went into researching False Memory Syndrome and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation with an open mind. The concept of false memories was vaguely familiar to me, but all I knew about the foundation was that it was started by a married couple whose daughter claimed to have recovered memories of her father essaying her in childhood, but that her memories of the abuse weren't real and what she actually suffered from was false memory syndrome. I'd also heard that one of their goals is to prove that dissociative identity disorder isn't real, and apparently they go after people who publicly talk about it. <laughs> Given the fact that I'm a survivor of CSA and have DID as a result of that abuse, they were already on my side. I'll admit that. However, my thoughts and opinions about the foundation aside, I was still open to the possibility that false memories or false memory syndrome could be a real thing. I mean, it's in textbooks and used in court cases after all. Initially, my plan was to look into the foundation and give an objective presentation of the facts. Why it was created, who it's made up of, what their goals are, and then evidence both for and against false memory syndrome. But I did not anticipate the soap opera level conspiracy Pooja, what is this behavior? at the heart of the foundation. I'm talking everything from what actually led to its creation, to the founders themselves, and the despicable things they did to their daughter, and the people who supported them and served on the board of the foundation. Like straight up PDF file apologists and advocates for people accused of CSA. I am not exaggerating in the slightest. I think Finn's dreaming about the board of the foundation. <laughs> Get him, Finn. Fatality. There's a lot to go over, and I'm gonna do it in two, possibly three parts, depending on how long it is when I record it. This video, part one, is all about false memory syndrome and the foundation according to their website. Part two, and possibly three, is all about false memory syndrome and the foundation according to other people involved and connected to the foundation basically the story of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation with some context. And trust me, this story is gonna blow your mind. I can't believe I was ever afraid of these people. But before we dive into all that, I wanna give you one last warning. This video is centered around claims of CSA, incest, PDF files, and people trying to discredit victims of CSA. I always do my best to talk about subjects like these in a mindful and non-triggering way. So, I will not be giving detailed accounts or even mentioning specific types of CSA, okay? And if you're okay with just hearing the abbreviation CSA, I think you'll be just fine with this video. I really do. But, as always, viewer discretion is advised. Also, any and all claims made are alleged, unless otherwise noted, and all of my sources are linked in the description of this video. And with that, let's dive in. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation, as they tell it. 
According to their website, fmsfonline.org, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, or FMSF, was founded in 1992 by a group of families and professionals who, quote, saw a need for an organization that could document and study the problem of families that were being shattered when adult children suddenly claimed to have recovered repressed memories of CSA, end quote. The foundation was dissolved on December 31st of 2019, which was news to me. But it used to be ran by, quote, the Scientific and Professional Advisory Board, which was composed of prominent researchers and clinicians from the fields of psychiatry, psychology, social work, law, and education, advised on issues of memory, therapy, and research, end quote. There's a list of the board members on their website if you'd like to check it out. At a glance, they appear to be predominantly PhDs, which I would say lends them a great deal of credibility, but to be honest, I didn't look into each and every one of them. But I did look into some of them, which we'll get into later. I think it's safe to say that most people wouldn't look into them either and just kind of take it at face value. And that plays a very important role in the foundation, which we'll also get into later. The goals of the foundation were, quote, to seek the reasons for the spread of FMS that is so devastating for families, to work for ways to prevent it, to aid those who were affected by it, and to bring their families into reconciliation, end quote. They give a more in-depth explanation as to what they did under their accomplishments section, saying, quote, the FMS Foundation played a critical role by acting as a clearinghouse of scientific information and as a catalyst for discussion of specific claims regarding memory. The FMSF scientific advisors actively contributed ideas and further research in controversial areas of social influence and therapeutic practice, as well as sparking debates in various crucial areas of memory research. Through good scientists and serious clinicians working together to advance understanding of the vulnerability of patients being encouraged to delve repeatedly into childhood memory reports, the false memory syndrome became better understood and some families were even able to achieve reconciliation. Unfortunately, for many other families, their adult children re-experiencing in therapy childhood memories through a veil of adult misfortunes, disappointments, and depression crystallized feelings into unwavering beliefs in past events that never happened." End quote. And this wasn't listed as an accomplishment on their website, though I'm sure they consider it one. One study showed that in 1991, the year prior to the group's foundation, in several popular press outlets, 80% of the stories about abuse were weighted towards survivors. Whereas three years later, more than 80% of the stories focused on false accusations, often involving supposedly false memory syndrome. What is false memory syndrome? Well, <laughs> false memory syndrome isn't in the DSM, or an actual clinical diagnosis of any kind. The founders of the foundation made up false memory syndrome in response to their daughter claiming to have recovered memories of her father abusing her. And their website gives a few different definitions as to what it is. Definition number one, false memory syndrome is a psychological condition in which a person remembers events that have not actually occurred, suggesting it's an actual psychological condition, which it isn't, Definition number two, false memory syndrome is a situation in which examination, therapy, or hypnosis has elicited apparent memories, especially of CA, that is disputed by family members and are often traumatic to the patient. This one defines it as a situation. situation. And then we have a few more definitions. They settled on the name false memory syndrome, quote, because many of the accusers claimed that they were suffering from repressed memory syndrome. And since the parents were convinced that what their children thought were memories were really incorrect beliefs, the term false memory seemed appropriate. The parents described their children as being totally consumed by their new beliefs, end quote. So this one really narrows it down to parents and their children. So far, it's a psychological condition and or a situation in which adult children recover traumatic memories of CA that their families, or just their parents, insist aren't true and describe their adult children as being totally consumed by their allegedly false memories. Does that make it any clearer to you? Well, 
we have one more definition. Quote, when the memory is distorted or confabulated, the result can be what has been called by the foundation, the false memory syndrome, a condition in which a person's identity and interpersonal relationships are centered around a memory of traumatic experience, which is objectively false, but in which the person strongly believes. Note that the syndrome is not characterized by false memories as such. Uh? We all have memories that are inaccurate. Rather, the syndrome may be diagnosed, but not really because it's not a real diagnosable condition, when the memory is so deeply ingrained that it orients the individual's entire personality and lifestyle, in turn disrupting all sorts of other adaptive behaviors. The analogy to personality disorder is intentional. False memory syndrome is especially destructive because the person assiduously avoids confrontation with any evidence that might challenge the memory. Thus, it takes on a life of its own, encapsulated and resistant to correction. The person may become so focused on the memory that he or she may be effectively distracted from coping with the real problems in his or her life." End quote. Oh, my brain hurts. It's my understanding that they settled on the name false memory syndrome for a few key reasons. The parents, aka the accused parties, claim the memories are false. And I didn't see anything about them providing proof that the memories are false, just that they claim they are. And the syndrome refers to how the person with the alleged false memories is affected by or changes as a result of them. I would imagine things like feeling devastated or traumatized by the memories, maybe cutting off contact with one or more of the family members, things that are not at all uncommon for victims of CA. And according to the foundation, people with false memory syndrome avoid any evidence that might challenge or invalidate the memory. And lastly, the reason why people who allegedly have false memory syndrome insist the memories are real, I guess this is more implied, is to distract them from coping with the real problems in their lives or assuming any responsibility for them. You know, this reminds me a lot of the experience Dr. Vincent Felitti had after he discovered that hundreds of people in the obesity clinic he was running were victims of CSA. And when he tried to tell other medical professionals about his discovery. It was by then clear that this was very real, but nobody, nobody wanted to know about it. At a national meeting in Atlanta, I was attacked by the audience. Some guy gets up and under the guise of asking a question, he makes the pronouncement The people who know more about these things like they understand that these statements by patients are basically fabrications to provide a cover explanation for failed lives. I'm mad as shit. Someone like, oh my god. Go get fucked, bud. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. I have a few thoughts. First of all, what do they mean by evidence that challenges the memory? All I could find on their website was that the accused parties denied that the abuse happened. That's it. Also, I wonder to what extent the evidence would matter. For instance, let's say that the alleged victim can't recall or describe a distinguishing mark on the alleged abuser's jennies. Would that, to the accused party, be evidence that the memory was false? I have memories of abuse that I've been aware of my entire life, so not even recovered or repressed memories. And I couldn't describe to you distinguishing marks, but that shit really happened. Or how many historically accurate or externally validated details of the abuse is one required to remember? for the memory to be considered true. And what if the people who could validate the memory don't accurately recall what happened? Their memories or motivations to deny the claims don't seem to be called into question in any of this. A few years ago, and totally out of the blue, I recalled a doctor that I saw when I was really young, like three years old but I couldn't have picked her out from a lineup or described any encounter that I actually had with her. In fact, I didn't even remember her name. 
I just had this vague memory of her. And the only other memory that I had associated with her was the production credits that would roll at the end of the Oprah Winfrey show. And I remembered thinking that the animated version of Oprah was actually of my doctor and that Harpo was the spelling of her name. So I called my mom and asked her about this doctor and she had no clue who I was talking about. I told her about the few things that I could remember and my mom insisted that I never had a black lady as a pediatrician and that I'd only ever had this one white lady and she had no clue who I was referring to. And given that my mother was the adult at the time, it's safe to assume that she would remember more accurately than I would, right? Well, I wasn't satisfied with her answer, so I took to the internet with the few details that I did have, and I found her. Her name was Dr. Ibalo. Harpo, Ibalo, I can see the connection. <laughs> so I called my mom back, Dr. Ibalo, Oh my God, I totally forgot about her. How did you remember her? I was right. Even though I couldn't tell you any details about her or recount any experiences that I had with her, I remembered her and my mother, the adult, did not. Questioning memories, Q and A's. For this section, I'm gonna do my best to paraphrase their answers and provide relevant information, and I'll distinguish between the two, okay? And this Q&A is on their website if you wanna check it out for yourself. Why would someone remember something so horrible if it didn't really happen? They lay out a very specific way in which this happens. According to them, and again, I'm paraphrasing here, the cultural conversation and media we consume endlessly trumpets the idea that CSA can negatively impact our mental health in adulthood and that this primes us to accept the possibility that we could be victims. Then when a patient goes to see a therapist who also believes in the connection between CSA and negative mental health effects in adulthood, and concludes that the patient's problems are the result of past trauma, and tells them they won't get better unless they remember the trauma, the patient will make up memories of trauma because they want to get better. That's their singular explanation for how false memories are created. Here's my refutation. They don't cite any statistics, studies, treatment modalities, or anything to support that this actually happens let alone its prevalence. Rule number one, cite your sources. There are, however, countless sources of information based on decades of empirical research proving there is without a doubt a relationship between CSA and negative mental health outcomes in adulthood. See the ACE study for one. I did a video on it and I'll put a link up top and in the description for you to check out. How do I know if my memories are true? According to them, without some kind of external corroboration, no one can discern between true and false memories. And there's no evidence that certain techniques, like repeated and suggestive questioning or hypnosis, produce historically reliable memories. Quote, memory is constructive. That is, people take bits and fragments of recollections from the past and use them to reconstruct a narrative that makes sense to them in the here and now. End quote. On this point, I kind of agree with them, at least in part. For example, it's pretty widely known that false confessions are a real thing, resulting from repeated and suggestive questioning from law enforcement officers with agendas. But then I come back to, to what degree does historical accuracy of or the ability to externally corroborate a memory matter? especially when we know it's pretty common to not recall every detail about a traumatic experience. And by their own admission, we all have inaccurate memories. Even with non-traumatic memories, if someone were to ask you, did you ever go to a theme park as a kid? If you know you did and said yes, but then that person presses you for external corroboration and asks you to describe in detail what you were wearing, who you were with, what they were wearing, what time of day it was, what you ate that day, what rides you went on, etc. If you can't recall those specific details, 
Does that mean you don't really know whether or not you went to a theme park as a kid? No, that's ridiculous. I need to blow out this candle. It's getting a little too fragrant in here and we've got a long way to go. Maybe we'll just leave one wick burning for the time being. Can a checklist of symptoms be used to tell if essay occurred? They say that the recovered memory literature claims to list all sorts of symptoms, even contradictory ones, that prove past abuse, and that no checklist of signs or symptoms proves that past SA occurred. They even cite the American Psychological Association, which said, quote, there is no single set of symptoms which automatically indicates that a person was a victim of abuse, end quote. I agree. There is no single set of symptoms that automatically proves past SA occurred. There are, however, a whole lot of symptoms and mental health problems and negative outcomes that a lot of victims of CSA, even those whose memories aren't repressed and therefore aren't in question here, have in adulthood, such as depression, anxiety, substance dependence, chronic pain, again, See the ACE study for more. They're not universal, and you don't automatically end up with a certain set of them if you are a victim of CSA. What is a flashback? They describe it as a vivid image or collection of images experienced while awake, and add that it originally referred to altered states of consciousness caused by drug use, specifically LSD. They go on to say that the content of flashbacks were treated as historically accurate in SA and trauma literature. And they add that flashbacks are not proof that past abuse occurred. I don't know about any of that because again, they didn't cite where they got that information from, but I wish they did. But I did find that since at least 1980, the term flashback has been used in the DSM to refer to feeling like they're reliving a past traumatic experience. And historical accuracy of the flashback doesn't seem to be a factor here. The American Psychological Association, who they cited before, defines flashbacks as, quote, the reliving of a traumatic event after at least some initial adjustment to the trauma appears to have been made. Memories may be triggered by words, sounds, smells, or scenes that are reminiscent of the original trauma, as in a backfiring car triggering a flashback to being in combat, end quote. No, I need to blow this candle all the way out. What are body memories? They claim that therapists have told their patients that the body remembers what the mind forgets, and that many physical sensations are symptoms of forgotten CSA. They also claim that these therapists recommend massage and other physical techniques to access forgotten memories of abuse, and that there's no scientific evidence that a physical pain or sensation is proof that abuse occurred. Once again, I don't know where they got that from. I don't know if a therapist has ever claimed that a physical sensation was proof that abuse occurred. If they're gonna be lazy about their claims, I'm not going to waste my time refuting them, but I will include a link to an NIH study titled Clinical Manifestations of Body Memories, the Impact of Past Bodily Experiences on Mental Health. Is an eating disorder a sign of SA? They claim that some therapists assume that anyone with an ED is a victim of CSA, and that others claim that aversions to certain foods indicate past SA. Just one more thing they want us to take their word on, they do cite the October 1997 Harvard Mental Health letter, which said that the connection between EDs and CSA had not been confirmed. However, I couldn't find it. Here's my refutation. No, EDs are not proof that someone has a history of SA. I'll include a link in the description to a 2004 case study of women participating in the Harvard study of moods and cycles that found that women with histories of CSA were three times as likely to develop an ED and four times as likely to be diagnosed with an ED according to the DSM. And a study from 1989, so three years prior to the foundation, that found the connection between CSA and EDs to be significant. <laughs> Are traumatic memories more accurate? Quote, the scientific evidence is clear. Memories of events, whether traumatic or not, are reconstructed, that is, continuously reworked over time. 
As a result, all recollections are subject to change as time passes, end quote. They also say, quote, theory of repression or dissociation or traumatic amnesia is based on several assumptions that lack scientific support, end quote. And according to them, the following are unfounded beliefs about repression. Number one, that people commonly repress traumatic memories. Number two, these memories are relegated to a region of the unconscious where they are protected from the kinds of decay affecting other memories. Number three, therapists can help excavate these memories years or decades later. Number four, such recollections, once excavated, are accurate. And number five, recalling and working through traumatic memories are essential for healing. I don't know. What is their claim? Is it that they believe therapists are forcing their patients to make up memories of abuse they have no recollection of? Or is it about the ability to externally corroborate the accuracy of the memories? And are they calling repressed and false memories the same thing? Is there evidence supporting the collection of beliefs about repression? Quote, for more than 60 years, researchers have been seeking scientific evidence that people repress traumatic memories. To date, which is unspecified, they have found none, end quote. They add that according to the American Psychological Association in 1995, quote, the reality is that most people who are victims of CSA remember all or part of what happened to them, end quote. And the foundation says, quote, no special mental mechanism protecting a memory from natural decay has ever been found and no scientific evidence shows that psychological healing requires unearthing memories, end quote. And here's something I found about alleged repressed memories of CSA. Quote, several plausible alternative explanations have been put forward to explain the apparent forgetting of traumatic incidents. For example, people who are victimized do not want to talk about or may even forget the traumatic experience, but that does not equate with the unconscious repression of trauma. Second, a well-known phenomenon called the forget it all along effect might explain people's claims that they have forgotten their traumatic experiences. Specifically, according to this phenomenon, some people who claim to have forgotten SA all along may not have, as further investigation can reveal that they actually disclosed their memory to others, but have forgotten this disclosure. Third, people might not have experienced the event in question as traumatic at the time it happened and later reinterpreted the event as being abusive in retrospect. Finally, a voluminous body of research has shown that contrary to the idea underlying the concept of repressed memories, traumatic memories are in general well remembered." End quote. What does the foundation know about retractors and retractions? Quote, retractors are people who say that their memories of abuse were wrong. People retract because they believe their memories of abuse were false, their accusations unfounded. What led them to retract varies from person to person. Some changed therapists or left therapy because their insurance ran out. Others had supportive spouses, siblings, or friends who helped serve as important reality checks. Others read about people in similar circumstances or saw something on television and started to read more about memory. Some, without initially retracting, returned to the family because of a significant event, wedding, illness, birth, or death, and only later in that familiar environment began to question their memories." End quote. They don't mention how many people or what percentage of people with alleged false memories retract them. Under their research about retractors section, they list 10 studies dating from 1995 to 2004 that they say focuses on retractors. I clicked on one study under their lab research recovered memory section that clearly stated that there are normal forgetting processes that can explain the forgetting and subsequent recovery of traumatic memories. The evidence. Their website includes a section titled Current Scientific Understandings About Repressed Memories, which you can review if you'd like. I skimmed through it before really starting in on confirming or denying their claims or their evidence. And I found that on the Foundation's Wikipedia page, 
a number of people seem to have come to the same conclusion that I have. Quote, the claims made by the FMSF for the incidence and prevalence of false memories have been criticized as lacking evidence and disseminating alleged inaccurate statistics about the problem. Despite claiming to offer scientific evidence for the existence of FMS, the FMSF has no criteria for one of the primary features of the proposed syndrome, how to determine whether the accusation is true or false. Most of the reports by the FMSF are anecdotal, and the studies cited to support the contention that false memories can be easily created are often based on experiments that bear little resemblance to memories of actual SA. In addition, though the FMSF claims false memories are due to dubious therapeutic practices, the organization presents no data to demonstrate these practices are widespread or form an organized treatment modality. Within the anecdotes used by the FMSF to support their contention that faulty therapy causes false memories, some include examples of people who recovered their memories outside of therapy." End quote. Look at the material. You should be going home You can anyway. be the judge of it. Quite possibly the best evidence against their claims is the truth behind what led to the foundation and the people behind it and why there isn't much evidence at all. An important detail that's missing from the website is that the foundation was started by Peter and Pamela Fried after their adult daughter Jennifer alleged that Peter essayed her in childhood and into her teens. In their mission to spread the word about this syndrome they made up, they continuously lied about Jennifer and how she came to recover the memories of abuse, like saying they were the result of hypnosis when they weren't and used those lies to bolster their claims about false memory syndrome. And that's what we're gonna pick up in part two, the whole story. There's one article I reference a lot in it called War of Remembrance, and it was just that, a war, fraught with betrayal, assumptions, threats, resentment, and not at all surprisingly, media misinformation. The Frights have managed to redefine one of the oldest issues in mental health, the reliability of memory, so that their problems, their concerns, and their fears now loom in judgment over a hundred years of psychoanalytic colloquy. Let me know in the comments if you've heard of false memory syndrome or the False Memory Syndrome Foundation before. And if you have, how did you hear about it? Put all your thoughts down in the comments and I will respond to them. Like, subscribe, comment, blah, blah, bloody blah. Thank you very much. And be sure to turn on all notifications so you'll know when part two comes out in the next week or two. Thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you in part two. Now it's supposed to fit.